Okay, so uh, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And today we have our speaker is uh, Leandro Pimentel from, from our probability group. And he is going to talk about integration by parts and KPZ to point function. So it's uh, with you, Leandro. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Guilherme, and thank you, Alalia, for organizing this uh, nice webinar. And uh, so I, I would like to say that I agree uh, that my presentation uh, is recorded. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to start. Let's say, uh, so uh, are, you, are you seeing the, the, the slide? Oh, no, no, I just, I have to start the... No, just, no. Okay. No. Okay, okay. okay. I, it will. Uh, Okay. So, yes, okay, now? Now we see it. Okay, okay. okay. So let's start. I'm, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, uh, so the, the main uh, subject is the, the two-point correlation function of the KPZ fixed point. And uh, so I will explain you how you can actually uh, get uh, some information on this uh, function by using uh, uh, a very important important tool from uh, from stochastic calculus from Malievan calculus uh, that is the integration by parts formula okay so let me start with a very uh, brief uh, introduction to uh, the kpz universality class and uh, it starts in uh, with a paper of uh, kada paris and Zhang, where they introduce a uh, uh, partial differential uh, equation, stochastic partial differential equation, um, for the to describe the height profile of a growing interface. So H uh, at uh, position x at time t represents the the height function at at position x and time t. Okay, and uh, so you you can uh, have uh, x in rd so is this represents space and time by t okay so that's why we call it d plus one row so d for space and one for for time and uh, so this is the equation that they uh, they introduce okay where you have three key uh, features of this equation uh, so the first one is uh, what they call the re relaxation of the interface of or some sort of smoothing smoothing uh, mechanism which is given by uh, this first term here, which is the Laplacian of the function. Okay, the Laplacian with respect to x. And then you have this uh, lateral growth, which is, uh, introduces slope dependence uh, for the growth rate. Okay, and they choose to put a square of the gradient, which is somehow the lowest uh, nonlinear term that you can uh, put here, uh, nonlinear in terms of the, of the of the slope of the interface, okay? And then you have a random force, which is given by a space-time white noise here represented by chi, okay? And uh, so they, they were actually uh, inter interesting to study the general growth models, which have these uh, key features, and they kind of propose this canonical uh, model that is given by the KPZ equation, okay? And uh, so what came is that uh, in dimension D equals to one, they conjecture uh, by using some uh, uh, normalization type of argument that uh, for D equals to one, uh, so the fluctuations, you would have like a speed, uh, a microscopic speed of growth, okay? Which is given by this term B times NT. And, uh, and then the fluctuations around this uh, microscopic speed uh, will be given by a universal Markov process that is uh, what we call the KPZ fixed point. And what is also important is this two uh, critical exponents, n to the two-third and the n to the one-third. So n to the two-third here represents the, the size uh, that you uh, see uh, these non-trivial fluctuations occurring, okay? 
the size in the space, and then n to the one third is actually the size of the fluctuations that you see. Okay. So yeah. the conjectures, just repeating that, is that uh, every uh, one plus one interface growth that has some sort of KPZ growth mechanism would have the same uh, fluctuations given by this uh, universal Markov process, call it the KPZ fixed point. Okay. Leandro, can I just make a very stupid question? Yes, sure. In the previous slide, you have uh, in the KPZ equation have two parameters, the nu and lambda. Are they? Yeah. They are positive, I, I believe. Or, uh, or, oh, or uh, it, it doesn't really matter. Not, not necessarily. Lambda can be negative. Okay. Or of course, if you take lambda equals to zero, then you don't have this uh, this the second mechanism, the slope dependence. Okay. So mm -hmm. just assume that they are non-zero. Okay. Oh, okay. And you can okay. like new, you can take it uh, strictly positive, okay? Okay. And then lambda can be any number uh, different from zero. Okay. okay. So they are not important to have this growth property or something like this. Uh, I mean, for to, as you said, that you expect to have this uh, uh, asymptotic behavior. No, no, they don't really play. A, as soon as lambda is uh, different from zero, then they should all be in this KPZ universality class. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you. Actually, for lambda equals to zero, you have just a uh, stochastic heat equation, which is not in the KPZ universality class, okay? Okay, But as Thanks. soon as lambda is different from zero, then you should have this uh, KPZ universality. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me give you uh, an example of a model where you have uh, KPZ fluctuations. Okay, our uh, interactive particle system, which is that the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. And then you also have a, what we call the Haidt function or the Haidt profile associated with this totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. So let me remind you what is this uh, particle system. You have, so I, here I have the uh, sites given by the integer numbers. And I have particles and or no particles. So it's occupied by a particle or not or empty. Okay. And here I have a like a, a this is a my initial uh, configuration of particles. I have a particle at site minus one, a particle at site zero, at site one, and site three. Okay, these blue dots represent the particles. And the particles they move. Uh, so this is the totally asymmetric. So they will only allow to move to the right, one step to the right at height one, but they have to follow the exclusion rule which means that uh, if they try to move to a site that is already occupied, then the move uh, is not allowed. So it's suppressed, okay? So that's why we call it exclusion, because you can only have one site, at most one site, uh, one particle per site, okay? And then uh, I can uh, associate to this uh, particle configuration a height profile, okay? Which is, uh, which I draw here. And uh, it's very simple how to construct it from uh, the particle configuration. So I will start at zero. And uh, so this is x equals zero and um, y equals zero too. So it's point zero zero, which is. So every time I see a particle, um, I will go up. So here at zero, I have a particle, so I go up. And if, I, if the site is empty, then I go down. So here I see a particle, then I go up again, then I go down and down. And I keep, I just do it uh, from left or from right to left, okay? So I can construct this uh, interface from the particle configuration, okay? And now I let the process to move, okay? So for instance, this particle that, the particle that was at site minus two moved to site minus one. And so the, 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 pro, the rate profile also changed because now I have a particle at minus one, so I go, will go up at minus one too, okay? And then I will go down and down and, okay? So what you see is that uh, uh, when you have this local minimum, this represents a, when you have like a particle and an empty side, okay? So a particle to jump to the right means that this, uh, a local minimal will become a local maximum at height one, okay? So this is what happened. And uh, so this particle that was at site three moved to site four, and then you also have a movement here in this interface and so on, 
Okay? So I can couple uh, the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process with a height, um, a, an interface that is growing, okay, also with time. So here I have a, a simulation, okay? And at the bottom, you see this very small particles here, okay? Uh, so uh, the, the, for this simulation, we start with the particle configurations where you have particles at site at the negative sites and uh, empty, uh, you have no particles at the positive sites. Okay, so this corresponds to you, you go down from, uh, from the right and then you go up uh, like this because it's particle, 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 uh, no particle, no particle, no particle, okay? And then you let it evolve at, uh, and then I, I stop the simulation at some time, a larger time. Uh, so what you see here in red is the macroscopic shape of the growth interface. Is, which is in blue here, the microscope shape is in red and the growth interface is in blue, okay? And uh, so what we want to do is actually to, uh, to do this uh, zoom, to do like a zoom, uh, zoom in in this box of size n to the two third n to the one third, okay? And if I do this, what I will should see is the, is, uh, the KPZ fixed point which will correspond to this initial uh, profile, okay? So it turns out that this, this totally asymmetric simple exclusion process is a very special uh, process because it has a very uh, nice, uh, it has a very nice uh, algebraic structure that uh, allows you to write down the mood point uh, distribution functions for height profiles or for particle profiles in terms of uh, Fred Holm determinants formula, okay? And this formula actually allows you to uh, do asymptotics and uh, to prove conversions for, uh, for, uh, for the, actually in the beginning it was not uh, the, the KPZ fixed point, it was, uh, so the first, the first result was uh, actually before uh, this work from Prahoff and Spoon in 02, it was, the work of Bike, Dyfe, and Johansson, where they were only study uh, the fluctuations at site zero, and not not for the totally symmetric simple exclusion process, but for the polynuclear growth model. But uh, for the for the the IRI process was actually introduced by Prahoff and Spoon, and also uh, studied by Johansson, and um, and they they prove uh, conversions uh, of the the TASEP height function to this AV2 process, uh, when you start your uh, particle configuration with this uh, type of uh, initial, what this is called the narrow edge initial condition, okay? And this, this actually corresponds to uh, the KPZ fixed point, look at one, and then you have this parabolic drift, and your initial condition is this uh, sort of uh, generalized function which is zero every, uh, which is minus infinity everywhere except at, at, at the orange, which is zero. Okay. And this IRE2 process uh, has the GUE trace window distribution at time, at uh, position x equals zero. Okay. Um, so then later, uh, the same type of uh, result was proved for the TASEP, but now start with the flat uh, or periodic initial condition. So if you start with, with, with uh, a configuration like a particle and no particle. So you have particle at uh, even sites and uh, no particle at odd sites, for instance, then you would, uh, you, in the limit, what you get is the IV, what they call the AV1 process, uh, which is so, uh, and it's related to the KPZ fixed point uh, by this scaling factors here. And you, you, what you see at uh, x equals zero is the GOE uh, trace window distribution. And uh, this was proved by Borodin, Ferrari, uh, Prahoff, and Sazamoto. It was actually predicted by Sazamoto uh, two years before, I think, and, but then it was really formalized in this paper. There's, there's all this convergence to this process. And then uh, in 2010, you also have the work of Baik, um, Baik and Ferrari and Peche, where they also prove the convergence to uh, what they call the ARISTAT, uh, which corresponds to the KPZ fixed point start from uh, 
a two side brown emotion with this square root of two uh, in front of it. So it means that diffusion equals two here. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just a brief uh, um, introduction to this, uh, what is the KPZ uh, fixed point. Uh, so and then, uh, kind of recently, uh, like almost four years ago, uh, Mateski, Costell, and Remenik, they were able to write down, uh, kind of solve, uh, because in the in the TASEP context, for for each initial condition, we would have like a, a very uh, kind of nice expressions for for your moot point distribution function, but then you would have to kind of solve it to do the, asymp the, the, the asymptotics and get conversions to, uh, to, to some uh, process, okay? And uh, so for each initial condition, you would, you would have like to solve this kind of equations to get the, as the right asymptotics. And they were, initially they were able to solve the equations for the narrow edge initial condition, for periodic initial conditions and for the, the stationary initial condition. And then uh, in, uh, four years ago, Mateski, Quastel, and Remenik, they kind of developed a method where they could solve it for any initial condition and get this, uh, actually, to, and they were able to write down the, to characterize the transition probabilities of this Markov of the KPZ fixed point, okay, in terms of determinantal forms, okay? And uh, so this is a, what we call the determinantal, uh, Fred Holm determinantal, which has a very explicit formula as soon as you know what is this uh, k. So k here is an integral operator. So the k of x, i, x, j is just the kernel of this operator. Okay, and then they, they just write down this. So this is the, the transition probability of uh, the KPZ fixed point that started at uh, time zero at, uh, with profile h. Okay, and then you see uh, the, the distribution at time t. So this is the continuous distribution. Okay, but from this formula, you can also get a uh, moot point distribution for fixed time t, okay? So then, of course, this operator, the operator that they got here, it depends on the time and on the initial profile and also on the function f that you have, okay? Okay, just... Uh, so uh, you also have uh, another description of the KPZ fixed point. Okay, uh, in terms of the directed landscape. Um, and this, this description was first introduced by, by Corvin, Costel, and Remenik, and then uh, formalized by Dovergine, uh, Hoffman, and Virag, uh, also recent, very recent. And uh, the, the point here is that you can also uh, uh, construct your uh, KPZ fixed point in terms of a variational uh, variational problem, which is right here, okay, uh, where H is your initial condition. So I put H here just to see that uh, you have at time S, so uh, you have profile H, and then you want to see what is uh, the value at X at time T. So if you want to compute that, then you have to solve this variational uh, problem here. And, and more important, this L here is what they call the directed landscape, which is uh, somehow uh, a, a very geometrical object because uh, you, you can see this as some sort of distance or some sort of metric between space-time points. So here is, you can think that it's, you have uh, Z is a, uh, represents space at time X, and you X, uh, oh, sorry, at time S, and then you have X at time T, okay? So this L from Z at time S to X at time T, you can see this as some sort of metric. It actually does uh, satisfy some sort of uh, uh, sub or superadditive uh, property, okay? And, uh, and this landscape, uh, this direct landscape is also related to the ARI2 process uh, in, in the way that if you fix X, T, and S, then what you see is the rescale ARI2 process minus a parabolic drift, okay? So you have this representation of the, 
of the Cape is fixed point, okay, in terms of the direct landscape, and uh, also for fixed time for fixed space uh, uh, variable x, okay, and fixed time t, you you can uh, so you in distribution you also have this uh, representation for the the KPZ uh, fixed point, which is which will be very useful for us to compute this two point function, which I'll, I will introduce uh, in a minute. Okay. Um, so what, what are the advantages? So uh, this, this, this was the first uh, approach to, to define actually what, what was the, the KPZ fixed point. So th these formulas are kind of complicated. You, 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 can, you cannot only actually uh, compute uh, this determinant of four for certain initial condition. This is kind of, uh, so this, to, to see what is this operator, uh, it might be very complicated uh, if H or F, uh, or actually if H is, is kind of uh, also very complicated, okay? So, so it's nice to have this formula, but uh, sometimes it's also not very uh, informative in terms of what, if you want to study long time behavior, or if you want to study some qualitative behavior of your KPZ fitted point, then this, this representation is, can also help you a lot, okay? Uh, so one important analogy here is that this, this representation somehow, uh, for instance, allows you to, uh, to start your KPZ fixed point with two different initial conditions and then use the same direct landscape to run the, the KPZ fixed point. So you, so you can, you, you, you have naturally, you have like basic coupling, for instance, if you consider the KPZ fixed point uh, construct from the directed landscape. And uh, also that uh, very, uh, some, some properties of the KPZ fixed point are, come from the properties of this directed lens, from the geometry, uh, the geometrical properties of this directed landscape as well. Okay, okay so we also have this uh, uh, two uh, important uh, properties of the KPZ fixed point. The first one is this one, two, three scaling. Okay, uh, so if you rescale your uh, KPZ fixed point at time t, okay, so S of gamma is just this diffusive scaling, okay, diffusive rescaling, actually. And if you rescale your KPZ fixed point at time t uh, in this way, then uh, you have this invariance in distribution, okay. And the one, two, three here comes from this fact that uh, when you have this diffusive scaling, then you have this exponent here, one, in front of f. You have exponent two, gamma square now in front of x. And then uh, what is the exponent that you have to put uh, in time here to get the invariance is exponent, exponent three. So this one, two, three corresponds to this one, two, and three here, which is, which is for instance, a different uh, of the diffusive uh, behavior normally, if you, uh, if you have a diffusive behavior, then you have one, two, and then you have to put like four here, not three, okay? You have to put four in the, in the front of the, the time. Okay, and then you have uh, this uh, invariant measure for the, the KPZ fixed point, which is given by uh, a two-sided two standard Brownian motion. Uh, so let me just uh, remember what is a two-sided standard Brownian motion. So, Standard Brownian motion, I think that everyone knows what this is, but uh, two sided means that uh, you have a standard Brownian motion at positive uh, values of x, and then you have uh, an independent uh, standard Brownian motion at negative sides, at negative uh, x as well. Okay, both of them are start at zero, and then you just put them together. Okay, this is the two sided Brownian motion. And then if you uh, consider two side Brownian motion with diffusion uh, given by uh, and this two here, square root of two, and then you have a drift for any value of mu here, then you have this invariance in distribution, okay? It's not that uh, the KPZ fixed point itself is uh, invariant, but if you do this uh, vertical uh, shift at zero, then you get uh, this invariance in time for the KPZ fixed point, okay? So, uh, so uh, in, this, uh, in this work, so I was interested uh, to consider uh, initial profiles where you have a Brownian, not, again, you have a two-side Brownian motion here, but with an arbitrary uh, 
coefficient beta in front of it, okay? Uh, and uh, so to define what uh, is the two-point correlation function, I will consider uh, uh, test functions, which are essentially L2 functions. Uh, and uh, so my, my observable of the system will be defined at time t with respect to the function, to the test of function phi. It's just the integral uh, of r of phi, and then I put uh, uh, dx uh, of h t, okay? Of course, I, I need to be very careful what, what, what do I mean by this integral here. But uh, for instance, at time t equals zero, I have a Brownian motion. So at time t equals zero, what I have here is just the Wiener integral of L2 functions with respect to this Brownian motion here, beta times. Um, uh, but for uh, t uh, bigger than zero, then I need to be more careful. But for instance, if I take beta equals to square root of two, then again, I can just define it as the, the Wiener integral of phi with respect to this new Brownian motion which will also depend on t, okay? And uh, if beta is not equal to square root of two, then I can define this, for instance, as a, the usual way. For instance, if I take a test function, which is uh, like smooth with bounded support, then I can just define this integral as like minus the integral of the derivative of phi times h of t and then dx, okay? So I, I, I can define it uh, also in this way for if the test function is like smooth for, okay? So uh, just uh, to remind you, I, I will also uh, consider this function, this scaling function g beta of x, which will be very important for us. Uh, this is defined as the variance of the KPZ fixed point at time one at position x, okay? where we also integrate all, over all possible Brownian initial profiles, okay? So this function, I, I, I would just uh, put the dependence on beta here because it will be important for us, okay? Uh, here I have a plot of this, of the distribution, actually, of the density of the KPZ fixed point starting from uh, this Brownian motion times beta here. Uh, and uh, uh, so this the, the white the, this first white curve here uh, corresponds to beta equals to zero, which is actually the the flat initial condition, and this other black uh, white one here is also is uh, corresponds to the beta equals to square root of two, which is the bike ren uh, distribution, and this this one is the GOE, this is the bike ren, and, and the other ones are uh, for different values of beta. So if I grow beta, then this, this density is just moving right to the right, okay? And this, this simulations were done by Chihita, uh, Ferrari, and Spoon very recently also. I think doing Monte Carlo simulations with the task set. Okay, so what is the two-point function? So the two-point function is... Uh, in terms of uh, distributions, okay, you can think that this dx of h0 and dx of ht are distributions and you want to compute the correlation, okay, space-time correlation. So you have at time zero, you look at it at the position u and then at time t, you look at it at position v. And you can think that this, uh, this correlation is given by some function which is translation invariant, okay? So this is why we have V minus U, and which also depends on T, okay? So in such a way that if I compute the expected value of two observables, of the correlation between two observables, what I get is this double integral of phi one and phi two with respect to this uh, two-point function here, okay? So the thing is, so can, can we compute this two-point function or can we get some information about this two-point function? And uh, I will just make some uh, observation here is that uh, you can, if, if this formula is true, okay, if you can write down this expected value in terms of a double integral with respect to some function, the two-point function, 
then you can also write down this expected value uh, as the cross correlation between phi one and phi two, okay? Where the cross correlation is just the, so the cross correlation between two functions, two test function is defined by this formula. It's, it looks like a convolution, but it's actually a, the, the, the cross correlation, okay? So you, you can see this by just doing a, a usual change of variables, just call V minus U call Z, then uh, you, what you get is this. Okay. okay, so the first result uh, in order to determine this uh, two-point function was due to, uh, there was actually a series of results. Uh, so first, uh, Prahoff and Spoon, uh, they indicate that the two-point function was, should be given by this formula. So remember that's, that this G is the variance of the KPZ fixed point at time one at position X. So this, I, what I have here is the second derivative of G, okay? And uh, they were only, they were studying first the, the stationary regime where beta equals two square root of two. And they indicate that this two point function be given by this uh, uh, formula here, just by the second derivative of the variance of the KPZ fixed point of this scaling function. And uh, then uh, Ferrari and Spoon, they kind of, uh, uh, prove it under some assumptions on, on, on the conversions of the TASEP to the KPZ, to the IRI stat uh, process, and which was finally uh, proved by Bike, Ferrari, and Peche in 2000, uh, and, and 2014, okay? And they finally proved this. Uh, and they, the, 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 the three papers, the, the, all the, the, the arguments were based on TASEP approximations of, of, the, of the KPZ fixed point, of the stationary KPZ fixed point with beta equals to square root of two, okay? And they also uh, point out that this, this function here, this scaling function here, gives the density of the KPZ uh, of the, KPZ scaling of the second class particle in the totally symmetric exclusion process. So I, I will not explain what is the second class particle, but for those who knows it, so this, this, this function gives the density of the, okay, in the stationary regime again. And uh, so what is also interesting is that this, this function, uh, this KPZ correlations can be tested in some experimental systems. And this was very recently uh, produced by let me uh, just uh, see here the names are uh, by Iwatsuka, uh, Fukai, and Takeuchi. So they uh, so before just just is just a plot of this of this density, this second derivative of a four, okay. And uh, so they were uh, they were running some experimental uh, in the lab where they. Uh, they were considering this uh, turbulent system, a liquid, a growing liquid crystal uh, turbulence, where you have two phases of turbulence. So we have the gray, the light gray one and the dark gray. So the light gray is uh, kind of a metastable and the, 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 the dark gray one is uh, stable. So that uh, the stable one eventually nucleates and expands and uh, forming this growing cluster bordered by a fluctuating interface. And uh, in the lab, they were able to trigger the, the, the stable uh, state nucleation by uh, shooting a, a laser in this liquid crystal. And then they also were able to control uh, the experiment and then design this, uh, this initial uh, profile and then run and, uh, and make some uh, statistical uh, testing to see the KPZ uh, uh, fluctuations and also the, the KPZ uh, two-point function. And here you see this. Uh, so the dots here represent this, this, this pigment, and then they see the bike range distribution here, the probability density. And they were also able to see this uh, two-point correlation function in the lab, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, so what I want to show you is this, uh, 
so this, this first result which is somehow a generalization of what was done by by uh, in the in the stationary regime okay and uh, and actually also uh, you have a bit more information here because uh, so the first thing is that uh, you can uh, so this the correlation between two observables of this just remind you that this this xt of phi is just the integral of uh, phi with respect to d uh, h dx of h at time t okay so you here you see this this observable at time zero then you have here the observable at time t and uh, what i get is this formula for the correlation between two observables given by beta square and then you compute the expected value of the cross correlation between phi one and phi, phi two apply at this location of the maximum of uh, Brownian motion of this our initial Brownian motion with parameter beta plus uh, an IRI uh, two process minus a parabola okay which is negative parabolic growth uh, and uh, we are also able to compute the density of this location of the maximum and then what we see is actually this uh, this KPZ scaling function given by the variance of the KPZ fixed point, the second derivative of the variance of the KPZ fixed point, as in the previous result. And as a conclusion uh, from uh, these two uh, formulas, what you get is this general formula for the two point correlation uh, for general values of beta. Okay, of course, for beta, it's strictly bigger than zero. Okay. Uh, so you have this uh, formula here, okay. And um, so with this formula, you can actually uh, conclude some, do some asymptotics. For instance, you can take the limit as t goes to infinity of t to the two third times this correlation. And what you will see is just this the second derivative at, at position zero divided by two times the, the cross, uh, the integral of the cross correlation between phi one and phi two. So in, in particular, uh, you see that this, this correlation goes to zero as fast as t to the power two over three, okay? And so what is another natural question is, so what can we say about this, the joint distribution of this vector here relate to this two, uh, of, so the joint distribution of the observable of the system at time zero and the observable of the system at time t Okay, and uh, so we can also prove something about this uh, joint distribution. And uh, what uh, we can actually prove is that uh, we can bound the Wasserstein distance between uh, the joint distribution and the product measure induced by its marginal. So this is just a, recalling you what is the Wasserstein distance between two uh, probability measures in R2. So eta and theta are two probability measures in R2. And uh, and L is a Lipschitz one function. Lipschitz one means that uh, L of x minus L of y modulus is smaller or equal than y minus x. Okay, so this the Lipschitz constant equals to one here. Okay, and what we can prove is that uh, so if it, theta t represents the the joint distribution of uh, this x this vector here and. Uh, eta t represents the product measure induced by the marginals, then the Wasserstein distance is bounded by this um, formula here. So here is have, you have one over the L2 norm of pi one, multiplied by square root of pi over two, and then you have again the cross correlation, the integral of the cross correlation, and then you have this scaling function again here, okay? And, um, and in particular, you also have this, that this, the distance between the the joint distribution and the product measure also scale as t to the two third. Okay, and then you have this very explicit uh, upper bound for the Wasserstein distance between these two probability measures here. Okay. So, uh, so these are the two uh, main results, and I want to, if I can, like ten minutes or explain you a little bit about the techniques of proof. And so, and that's why 
that's where the integration by parts formula comes. Okay. So the proof of theorem one is really a, an application of the integration by parts formula from Malyevon calculus. And the proof of theorem two is uh, some sort of adaptation of the Malyevon type method for asymptotic. Uh, uh, so the Malyevon type method was first uh, considered for normal approximations. Uh, and uh, so to prove theorem two, what, uh, what uh, we're going to see is that we can actually adapt this method to also prove asymptotic independence. We can also adapt this method to bound the distance between the joint distribution and the, the product measure induced by the marginals. Okay. And uh, so I put here a reference. Uh, so if you get more, if you get interest, more interest in these two uh, uh, subjects, uh, you can uh, go to the lecture notes from Dave de Nualard, uh, which, which are very nice uh, lecture notes given and during the probability school, uh, like I think it was two years ago or one year ago. Uh, and uh, so you have, it was published by Ensayos Mathematicus. And you can see uh, so what more details on this integration by path formulas and then what I mean by the smiley and sign method. But I will give you a, a very brief explanation of these two uh, subjects here. So the first one is, so what, what is smiley and calculus? So I will not explain you. It's a, it's a very uh, uh, kind of uh, very kind of complicated theory. It's not really simple to uh, understand what is going on, but uh, there are some objects that you can have some feeling and some intuition. So, uh, so, so let me uh, just explain you what is the integration by path formulas uh, with a very simple uh, uh, example. So, suppose you have uh, uh, this. This is just the Wiener integral uh, of a, a test function phi. Okay, in L L two. Okay, so I will denote it W of phi. Okay. So if you have another random variable, so random variable means here that you have a functional that depends on the whole trajectory of your Brownian motion. Okay, you can think of like, uh, uh, so the, the Wiener integral is an example of a random variable. You can take uh, the Brownian motion with some negative drift and then you can take the maximum, it's another random variable, or you can do some, you can just see what is the Brownian motion at some point, this is another random variable, uh, which depends on your Brownian motion, okay? And so, so the, the beginning of, so the, of this Malyavan calculus is to introduce this notion of differentiability with respect to Brown motion. So, so what does it mean? It means that you can uh, introduce what they call the Malyavan derivative of this random variable X with respect to the Brown motion. And what is this Malyavan derivative? So this Malyavan derivative is a stochastic process. So it depends on Z, okay? And uh, so uh, in the next slide, I will give you some examples of what, with, of what are these Maria van derivative with, so with respect to some examples of uh, random variables. But uh, the integration by path formulas uh, states that uh, if you want to compute the expected value of, for instance, the Wiener integral of phi times x, this e equal to uh, the expected value of the inner product of the Maria van derivative of x and phi, okay? So if you want to compute this product, so the expected value of this product, you can compute it by computing the Malia van derivative of x, and then do, you do the inner product with phi here, okay? Uh, and we will see that this is going to be very useful for us, okay, this formula. So before that, let just me give you some examples. So for instance, if you have, a, if your random variable is, a, so f is a nice function, think of a smooth function with bounded support, for instance. So if f is a nice function of uh, this Wiener integrals here, okay? So f is just a function from rg to r, and then I just compute it at uh, the Wiener integral of y1 until uh, the Wiener integral of phi d, okay? So what will be the, the, the Maria van derivative of this uh, random variable will just give it, will be given by this uh, formula here, you just take the partial derivative of f with respect to xj, 
compute at this uh, at positions uh, w of omega one and so on, and then multiply by phi j of c. Okay. Uh, and in particular, if you do the, the, the Maria van derivative of the Wiener integral, what you obtain is you obtain back your function phi. Okay. So this is actually the way you define it. So you define the, 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 the Maria van derivative for these functionals. For functionals like that, you define it like this. Okay. And then you keep extending the, the Maria van derivative for more complicated random variables. So for instance, if you want to. to uh, you can actually compute the Maria van der derivative of the KPZ fixed point if you, uh, so that's why you, it's important this uh, representation of the KPZ fixed point in terms of the directed landscape, because uh, with this representation, you can compute the Maria van der derivative with respect to your initial condition. Okay. And uh, it's, it's actually a, a well-known computation if you, if your random variable is a maximization of you, uh, you, you take the maximum of your Brownian motion plus something that has some sort of negative drift in such a way that this maximum is well defined, then the, the Maria van der derivative of this max is going to be given by the indicator function of the location of the maximum, okay, applied at z. So you, you have this uh, formula or the Maria van der derivative of the KPZ fixed point, okay? Where this ZT is just the location of the maximum in the variational representation of the KPZ fixed point, okay? So these are the two ingredients for us because now uh, if you go back to uh, what we want to compute, so we want to compute the expected value of x of phi one at time zero, x of phi two at time t. And just remember that this is just the Wiener integral of beta times uh, our Brown emotion. So this beta comes out and then I get just the, the Wiener integral with respect to the Brown emotion. And then I have this random variable of the Brown, of the Brown emotion, okay? Of course, this is also a random variable of the direct landscape, but it just, just fix the direct landscape, for instance and apply some sort of Fubini uh, to compute this expected value uh, with respect to Brown emotion and also with respect to the direct landscape. But in any way, you can write down this, this expected value of this product using the integration by path as the expected value of the inner product of the Maria van der derivative of our observable and phi one. Okay, and then you also have this beta. So what we have to do now is we have to prove that this observable x t of phi, which is the integral of phi with respect to dx of h at time t, is a differentiable with respect to your, our initial condition b, and that you also have this, that you, when you compute the, the expected value of this inner product, what you get is uh, this formula here. You get the cross correlation, then you, the, the location of the maximum. Okay, uh, so I will not prove it in uh, full generality, but I will just give you a brief explanation what happened if, for instance, you have a function phi 2 given by the indicator function of some interval a, b at u, okay? So in this case, uh, so this our observable is just given by the difference of the KPZ fixed point, okay? This difference at b and at a. And uh, so this, the Maria van der derivative is also linear, so you can also compute it. So it's going to be beta times the indicator function of the interval ZTA, ZTB, apply it to the small z here. And so you can just compute uh, this inner product here and the expected value. So if you, this is the primitive of our function, of our text function phi, so psi is a primitive of phi. So you just, this inner product will just give you beta times this expected value of the psi of zt at b and psi uh, of zt at a. And then you use this uh, scaling variance of, of the location of the maximum. So you have a translation at x, and then you also can rescale it by t to, to, to third. And um, so we can just write down this, each of this expected value as the expected value of psi one at x minus t to the third minus times z. 
and then uh, you just conclude that this guy will be given by again this inner product here and uh, which you can see that uh, is given by the expected value by, of the cross correlation of phi one and phi two apply at t to the two third times z. Okay. So and then uh, you from indicator function you can extend it for simple functions and then you can also extend it for more complicated function by doing some limiting uh, procedures which are kind of standard in Malyavan calculus. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's a brief explanation of the first uh, result. So I will uh, I will uh, just tell you that uh, you you can also use integration by paths to compute the density of t again using you know you have the formula of integration by paths here you can use it again and you can compute uh, this function g in terms of z and do derivatives and uh, actually. Uh, get again the, that the, the density of z is given by the second derivative of this scaling function g. Okay. Uh, so uh, do, do I have more, like five minutes, just to uh, give you a brief yeah, sure. of this, uh, of the second, because uh, I, I think this is also uh, kind of interesting. Uh, so let me uh, just give you a brief explanation of, of what is this time method for normal approximation. So, so the, 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 the initial idea is that you can characterize the, the normal distribution by looking at this differential operator. Okay, so this is a differential operator uh, where you have a function like a smooth function and you just take sigma square f prime of x minus x times f x. And uh, so this style lemma says that Z is uh, normal if and only if the expected value of this uh, differential operator applied to F at Z equals zero for all, all nice functions F, okay? So you can characterize the normal distribution by looking at these expectations here. And, uh, and the idea was that, uh, so if you have uh, another, uh, probability distribution like another random variable x and you want to measure the distance from the distribution of x to the normal then uh, you can solve this uh, equation which is the Stein's equation so you take this differential uh, operator and uh, if you can solve this equation okay then you can write down this. So for instance, if you take L uh, Lipschitz one function, then you can just write this the difference of these integrals. So this is just by definition. So if theta is the, 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 the law of X and eta is the law of, the, of Z, the normal law, then this, if you solve this equation, then you can write this difference as the expected value of the, your differential operator applied to F of L. So F of L is the solution of this equation apply to the, the this, your variable x. So if you want to bound the, the Wasserstein distance between eta, which is the normal distribution, and theta, which is another distribution, so what you have to do, you have to bound, uh, you, you need to be able to bound this, the expected value of this differential operator applied to x, so, and then see uh, how does it behave as you change this function l, okay? So now uh, you can apply a similar idea for uh, asymptotic independence in the sense that you want to bound the difference between the joint distribution and the, the product distribution induced by the marginals by doing a similar uh, procedure. So first you look at this differential operator, it's a partial differential operator, okay? And <laughs> you have this kind of uh, lemma, which is similar to Stein lemmas, which says that uh, x1 is normal and independent of x2, if and only if, uh, when you take expected value of the, your operator applied to f of x1, x2, it's equals to zero to every nice function f, okay? It does not characterize uh, the distribution of x2. It does, you only characterize the distribution of x1 and the independence between x1 and x2, okay? So now you, what you can do, 
So if you want to bound the Wasserstein distance between the product measure and the measure induced by the marginals, so you solve the equation, okay? So for each Lipschitz one function, for instance, I will solve this equation and I will prove some uh, kind of nice properties for the solutions of this equation, like this is uh, going to be bounded. And more importantly, I have bounds for the partial derivatives of the solution. And the third one is also is going to be very important because this square root of pi over two is going to be the square root of pi over two that appears in our results in theorem two. Okay. So, so again, so I solve this. I prove that there is a unique bounded solution and that you have this upper bounds for this solution. And uh, so what I will do is that just the solving the equation, I, I have that the Wasserstein distance between eta and theta, where theta is the, again, is the, the, joint, uh, is the joint distribution and eta is the product distribution induced by the marginals. So the Wasserstein distance is just bounded by this supremum here, okay, of this differential operator. So the point is, can I compute this? Uh, I, I have to upper bound that for my KPZ fixed point. Okay, so, be, so this lemma one and lemma, so lemma two and lemma three are just general lemmas. Okay, you can apply it in, in every situation where you have a normal and you have another random variable you, you, and you want to bound this, you want to bound the, the Wasserstein distance between the joint distribution and the product measure. But uh, now, so, if you want to get a good bound for the Wasserstein distance, we will, we need to bound this uh, this expected value here, okay? We're just recalling you that you have this differential operator, and it turns out that again uh, the integration by parts formula and the chain rule for uh, Maria van Kalkos allows us to to have a very nice bound. Why? Because so so the chain rule is just that you if you want to compute the the, the Maria van derivative of x of x1, x2, okay, f is just a nice function, smooth function, for instance, c1 function with bounded support, for instance, or with bounded derivatives. So the de Maliavon derivative of f of x1, x2, just the, you take the, the partial derivative of f with respect to x1, multiply by the Maliavon de, to, by the Maliavon derivative of x1, and then you sum of the partial derivative of x1, of x2, of f, and then multiply by the, the Maliavon derivative of x2, just usual, what you should expect of a chain rule, okay? And then we can apply this chain rule here. Why? Because, so I want to, uh, just recall it, that I want to apply this differential operator of at f and then compute it at, at our, the, this joint distribution of, of our observable of the KPZ fixed point, okay? So first I use the integration by path form. So saying that uh, I want to compute this expected value of this x, which is a Wiener integral times beta, and this random variable here, okay? So integration by pass tells me that this is beta, because here I have a beta, and then expected value of the inner product of the Maliavon derivative of f applied to x1 and x2, inner product of with phi1. And then the chain rule gives me this, the Maliavon derivative of this guy here. And uh, what I get here is that, uh, so, you see this, the first derivative here with respect to x1, it appears also here, but now I have a sigma square here. Why I have a sigma square here? Because when I compute the, the, the Maria Van derivative with respect to x1, so x1 is this guy here. This guy here is just the, the Wiener integral. And the Maria Van derivative of the Wiener integral is just the, the, the function itself. So what I get is just the inner product of phi1 with phi1, which is just the phi1, uh, which is just the square of the L2 norm of y1. Okay, and then I have a, a beta again, which is, gives beta square, and then, so this just gives you the sigma square, where the sigma square is actually the, the sigma square of this, uh, is the variance of this variable here, okay? And then I have the second part, which is the second derivative, uh, the, sorry, the, the partial derivative of, with respect to the second uh, variable, x2, apply to our uh, vector and then the, the Maria Ivan derivative of the observable at time t with respect to x2 inner product with phi1. Okay, so I have this formula and so what does it tell me? So it tells me that uh, if I take the expected value of this guy here, x1 times f of x1, x2, sigma square times the derivative, 
the uh, partial derivative of x1 of f, which is exactly our operator of differential operator, what I get is exactly what is written here. So from this formula here, what I get is that the expected value of the operator applied to f is actually given by minus beta times the expected value of the partial derivative of f with respect to x2 uh, times the, the inner product of this Malia-Von derivative of x2 with an uh, phi1. Okay, so uh, now I know that this, uh, if I have a solution of uh, our, my, my equation, FL, so I know that this second, this, this partial derivative with respect to the second variable is, is bounded by one over sigma square root of pi over two. So I have a very uniform bound of this term here, which is the only term that depends on F on L actually. And the second term which I, that I have is just this inner product between the, the, the Maria von derivative of X and uh, phi one, which I know how to compute. I know how to write it down with respect to this uh, scaling function, which is given by the second derivative of, of the variance of the KPZ fixed point at, uh, at position X. And uh, so that's it. So uh, just to uh, final consideration. So we, we obtain the two point function and the density of the location uh, by means of stochastic calculus applied to the KPZ point, and then we develop the, the Maria van Stein method for asymptotic independence and apply it to the KPZ point. And uh, so this, uh, I think that this can also be uh, applied to, so this methodology can also be applied to other models in the context of interactive particle systems and stochastic partial differential equations. And this is one direction of research. And I, maybe we can also compute the mood point distribution of the location of the maximum at different times, okay? Uh, so this are the reference of, uh, of the talk, okay? And I will, uh, I will finish here. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sorry for this delay. Okay, thank you. Let's thank uh, Leandro. So, uh, thank you very much, Leandro. Are there uh, questions? I, well, I don't want really to make a question, but I want to first to thank Leandro for this very nice talk. And uh, uh, and also, as all editors, you advertise your product. Leandro, Leandro gave me the opportunity. I inserted here in the in the chat, the link to Ensayos, where you find uh, the lecture notes of uh, Davi Noala. And uh, it's, it's a very easy place to start on this subject. And as Leandro was pointing, there are results going on in various SPDEs, so it's a very useful tool. So we, it's good that uh, so I advertise it for two reasons. It's good for people willing to learn. And also I take the opportunity to advertise because in science is a place where I would like uh, specialists in probability to sometimes send uh, lecture notes. So that's a double advertise. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot, Leandro. Uh, yeah, so uh, is there any other question? Because I, I have I have a two actually. So uh, Leandro, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. So, uh, so the, oh, my questions are very uh, naive, let's say. Because uh, so I was wondering if uh, this whole machinery that you have uh, developed and use it also many results from the Malia van calculus. Is it important that you have this two-sided Brownian uh, initial condition, or uh, or it doesn't matter to have it, this specific uh, initial condition? Um, so in, in our context, yes, it was very important to have a Brownian motion there. Okay, uh, but uh, you. So on the other hand, 
you you can also do Malevan calculus for for other I, I'm not a specialist okay but I, I was so during the the probability school uh, the Brazilian probability school I was talking a lot with Dave, David because mm -hmm. I was really interested on uh, on the subject and uh, so he told me that you you also have like Malevan calculus for 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 white noise for Poisson uh, environments for Poisson process for instance uh, mm -hmm. uh, so so that you can uh, for instance as I, as I was uh, mentioned uh, at the end uh, you you can try to 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 do this kind of calculations in uh, for interactive particle systems, you can use the Harris construction, which is a natural way to construct your particle system, and then use uh, some sort of stochastic calculus with respect to Poisson process to to write down some formulas and see if these formulas are telling you something interesting or okay. something that can help you to prove something interesting. Okay. That's the idea. Okay. And and for for the Stein method, it's 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 kind of general, you, you, you can also have Stein methods for for a, a more general distribution, not only for normal distribution. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, somehow, uh, for instance, if you, if you, a natural question would be to, okay, you, you take the, 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 the task set, you start it with Bernoulli, okay, and then you run it uh, for some time, and then you want to see what the, uh, what is the distance between the joint distribution and the distribution, uh, the product distribution induced by the marginals? Uh, mm -hmm. It turns out that you have uh, you have style method for binomials, for instance, and you can see if you, this uh, this kind of uh, idea uh, also gives you the uh, you know nice upper bounds for this time. Okay. Okay. No, that's nice. Yeah, the, my, my second question. Malia Volkov? Yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes, Olá. Olá, No, I was just going to comment that it's uh, very well adapted Malia Volkov to the abstract Wiener space. Abstract. Yes, yeah. 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 Okay, and then my, my second question is you, in the very beginning, you showed a picture where you had the expected curve for your uh, growth model uh, in red, I guess, and then, okay. you had, uh, and then you had in blue the fluctuation, the curve uh, coming from the fluctuation, right? Yes. And then, uh, do you, could you, could you, I mean, I don't know if you want you, if you are trying to prove uh, a sort of concentration inequalities for this, like if you, you know that expected curve at a given position t, uh, a given position x at time t, is given by the red curve, and then you want to understand how, I mean, deviations from this, how, how, how this depends on t and x. I, I'm not sure that this uh, uh, can be derived, uh, uh, how they say this, uh, directly from, from the computations and the results that you have shown today to us. Uh, have, you, have you thought about it? Uh, can you comment something about this? Um, yeah, uh, no, I, 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 I don't really know the answer, uh, but uh, uh, I very, I think like three, three months ago, I saw a paper, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think it was Gregorio Moreno uh, with two other co-authors, where they use uh, Malevan calculus to derive concentration inequalities for, for uh, so they have the, not the TASEP model, but the, the less passage percolation with Brownian, uh, with Brownian motions. And they kind of, I, 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 I don't really know the details, but uh, they were explaining that they use Malevan calculus to get concentration inequalities for, uh, for this uh, model. Because you, you also have convergence to the KPZ fixed point for Brown and less passage speculation. But, but yes, I, I, it's, it's a different uh, direction that you go. Because it, it's okay. a very general uh, theory 
you have very general tools and uh, they allow you to go in several directions. So what I did was I just took one direction which looks more familiar to me somehow. And, but okay. yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, and you also, you, I think you, you, they, they, there are also some results uh, related to concentrations in the right scale that can be derived by using this very uh, precise formulas for the moot point distribution of the task set. But okay. then you have to use this asymptotic theories for the terminal process and this kind of thing, I think. Okay. which is okay. not my uh, specialty. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, so is there any other question? So if not, let's thank it end again. So thank okay. you very much. Andrew. Thank you for you. For... Muito obrigado, Leandro. Foi ótimo. Ah, obrigado. Obrigado. obrigado.